start it now. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, so today we're going to continue working with the uh, editor project. And I think we're going to go through some very interesting steps that do not apply only to this data set, but really to any type of data set that you use in any analysis. So to, to start off, uh, so you're seeing here, let me go up a level in my folder structure. So this is my main folder for the, for the class. Um, I want to invite you to open your, uh, your own project. So the one that has your initials, and then you should again be seeing this, a similar structure here. I want to invite you to launch your RStudio project by double clicking on that RStudio symbol right there. So we should open um, an RStudio window um, that is focused on the project that we have. So on mine here, it didn't, it didn't pop up the script. Maybe on your side, you are already seeing your script. If yours is like mine, it would come here under the files tab. And um, if you're not at the root directory, you can click on that R blue button to take you to the root directory of this project. And then you would go under code and launch the um, wrangling code for today. So um, I'm just gonna go all the way up here on my table of contents. And I wanna invite you to, so there's, there's some extra things here that I added that you don't have yet. Yours should probably look more like this. We are gonna need to um, load all the packages here on the, on the setup chunk. So you can just go ahead and hit that play button. And also we're going to, um, well, let me, let, me, let me quickly ask you this. So I, I really want to just quickly mention again, uh, for us to use a color scale that is more, that is friendly with different types of color blindness. So there is a nice package called Veridis. You can kind of see that name right there. But I have not asked you to install that on the on the first time. So if you could install that, you can just start typing install dot packages. You're gonna see the function pop up. You can just click on it, open and close quotation marks, and just type Veridis like that. And then you can just run this specific line of code here by um, pressing command return or control return. It should work for you. And once you do that. Um, it's going to install, it's, it should be very fairly quickly and give you that message right below the chunk. And again, we only install once and then to use it, we need to load using the library function. So I'm just going to comment off that install packages Veridis and just going to, so have the library and then Veridis um, in parentheses. And if you run that, it should be, um, should already, I mean, it's giving me a message here, but it's not an error, so, so it should work. Okay, so um, to continue what we're gonna start today, I need you to import again this data set. So if you just wanna run that chunk uh, to import it, so you already have this code here, you should import all right. If you have any issues, you have to speak up now. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to follow. Um, but I'm assuming that you all were able to import last time. So I don't expect any issues, but I'll, I'll give a moment here in case anyone has issues. Okay, I don't hear anything. So I'm gonna move on. Um, so we're not gonna... You, uh, when you're... On, on here when you're trying to read? Yes, well, so when we set up all the folders and data sets, we copied and pasted this data set into the data folder. Let me, let me come in and help you. Hold on, guys, just a sec. Oh. 
Oh, okay. So what could have happened is the VPC tool says project none, which means that you should not use project. Um, can you go to the folders where like we have all that structure? So I think you could do we kind of we have to launch the project itself. So can you go back one? Can you try opening one of those close to your budgets? So you can see. Yeah, but we'll still see here project none. So that means, so maybe if you, let's see, can you go back to the folder again? And you can try to open the other uh, RStudio project. No, yeah, it's still not doing it. Um, let's, let's just go ahead and create a new project now. So I think that is helpful. So you can click there and create the project. Uh, necessary space structure, right? So, yeah. and then we'll see from there quickly. And then we can go out to the folder with your initials. So then we open So now, which folder is this? Projects. Is it the one? I think it is. Um, the only thing is that path that we had here, it assumes that your code is, in, is inside the code folder. So can you go back to the folder again on your Excel store? And the key thing is. You can just use that that one into that inside the full the full folder. Yes. Let's just try to cancel it. And if you can come back to your uh, actual studio, just go inside the full folder and watch that one. Let's see. Let's see if we have everything. Yeah, so there's not that special at all. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe you can come on. Yeah. So you can get set up for you. Yeah, there should. Yeah, there we go. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Stan, did it work all right? Yes, sir. Perfect. All right. So we're all we're all caught up. Anyone on Zoom having any issues here? Okay. I assume not. So we're gonna just uh Again, we have to have this yield object in our environment for us to keep working. We're not gonna go through everything we did last time and you don't have to, I mean, if you want, you can run it, but you don't have to, because we didn't save any of that. Uh, but just showing you quickly here. So we have the, date, the distribution for yield data. We see there's some very, very large outliers, the distribution for speed. And we also see there there's some low lying data points here on the on the speed distribution. And here, I just wanted to quickly show you, I was playing, so I just, if you want to do it now, you can, but it's more just wanna show you how the difference of how it looks. So this is, uh, I, I hashtagged off that scale color gradient low to red or red to green that we had before. And I just instead added this scale color Viridis that comes from the package Viridis that I showed you above. And this is the color, um, the color gradient that it gives us. And of course, we have that one data point that's controlling much of the upper uh, yield data points here. And if we uh, just constrain our deal, our yield data set to be below five thousand uh, pounds of length per acre, this is how it looks like. So now we have darker colors being lower yield and uh, brighter green colors yellow colors being higher yield. 
And this is just, you know, this is a colorblind friendly uh, uh, color palette. So that's, that, I think that that's very, very worthwhile to, to use uh, those type of upscale, uh, gradient scales. And then we also have this plot here with the dry yield and speed uh, relationship. We see that the largest dry yield values were being recorded under lower speeds. And then we just uh, talked a little about how this, how that low speed and also very quick shift in, in speed can create erroneous data points that we have to remove before really using our yield data set for anything. And then we talked about, um, you know, some of the columns that we have to have to, to do the yield cleaning. So we definitely need yield, speed, um, and also from a data, and also what well, we have, we need the coordinates as well. Uh, so X and Y, and also we, we, we spoke a little bit about from a data wrangling perspective, which is gonna make sense in a second here, what, uh, what that really means. What do we need to do to make this data set clean and intuitive and easy for, uh, let's say if you were, if this was a, was a project that you were collaborating with other people uh, to make this very intuitive for others, but also for your future self. Because I can tell you that in grad school and beyond, you're gonna have multiple projects going on and your future self sometimes doesn't really know what your past self was thinking at any point in time. So it's just good to have um, some of those practices. Okay, so with that, uh, we're gonna start our wrangling part, which again, it's something that every data set that you're gonna play with, you're gonna have to do some level of wrangling on it. So the first, uh, and, and also when I, when I do data wrangling, I like to add a W afterwards, just to indicate that's already a given wrangled version of my original raw data. So that's why I'm calling it yield 17 uh, W1. So you already have this there. The first step I do, uh, which in this case here is not gonna be super crazy because this data set had a pretty standardized uh, heading column scheme already, but sometimes you bring in some data that were collected by a machine or maybe by another person. And it's really a mess how, how columns are named. And just uh, a quick way of fixing that is, I'm gonna ask you to start, start coding with me now. Uh, so we use the assign <clears throat> uh, symbol there. And then there is this function called clean underscore names that comes from the generator package. So what we're gonna give the first argument here, it's gonna be the data set that we want to clean names of which is our yield 17. So see how yield 17 is our original raw data. We're giving it to the clean names function and we're saving this result to the yield 17 W1, right? So if we run this, we see our ob new object yield W1 appearing on the environment. And if we print it just to get a glimpse of what it happened or what it did here, it has some different um, behaviors you can choose, but the default behavior of clean names is just to put everything lowercase to remove any special characters if there are any on the column names. Um, and just, um, just to make things a little bit easier for us to, to use and see. So you can see how just apply that to all the columns. And again, this data set was not super crazy, uh, but sometimes you get a data set that has like 100, like 100 columns and they're all, funky named. So if you were to go in and rename each one of them individually, it would be a lot of work. So this is just a quick way of changing, changing that. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow a series of steps of wrangling here, where the, the output of the previous step is gonna serve as the input of the next one. So now, meaning that if you just wanna copy this EO17W1. We're gonna to go to the next chunk here where what I wanna do really is just to select the columns that we're gonna use. Cause right now we have, what is it? 18 columns and we already had a little bit of a conversation about which ones we need. So we don't need all those 18 columns for what we're gonna do next. So just to you know, make things a little bit easier for us to handle, I wanna select just the columns that we'll need. So if you hear on layout 17 underscore W2, just use that assign um, symbol and use the select function. So for the select function, 
The first argument is the data set that's coming in, which is the EO17 W1, the one that has already had the, the names cleaned. And then you can just add a comma and we're gonna tell it, I'm, I'm hitting return here, enter just to be easier to see, but we're gonna tell which columns we want to keep. So if we, let me just come up here very quickly. Remember now that the column names changed from when we were plotting, so they're all lowercase. So we need the speed, uh, we need dry yield, and then point X and point Y. So I'm just gonna come here and just type that. So speed, comma, enter, dry, underscore, yield, yield, comma, enter, uh, point, underscore, X, comma, enter, point, underscore, Y. So remember that now all those call names are lowercase. So if you have an issue on this, uh, it could be related to that. If you run this, and you, you would notice that EO17W2 now appears on your environment. And if we print it right below here, we see that now we only kept the columns we need. Let me just leave the code hanging there a little bit more in case you're trying to catch up. Well, you know, if, if we wanted to uh, subsequently look at elevation, we would have to include elevation here, right? Otherwise, we'd have to go step back, right? That's right, yes. That's that's exactly right. Yeah, and we could. I mean, you know, I I, I hadn't planned to show much of the elevation. I'm just asking for for future reference. I mean, oh yeah, 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 and also something that uh, I, I mean, I iterated myself a lot using these wrangling approaches, and something that I noticed is, especially if it's not my data set, if it's coming from somebody else that I'm helping with or collaborating with. I find it very useful to have their data set come in. I have one script where I only do wrangling. And then at the end of that script, I export my wrangled version. And then from that point on, I only use my wrangled version because that really saves me a lot of time. Every time I want to do something with that data set, it's already in a shape that I need. And it's not like all messy and all crazy. Um, so that's a good point, George, because if you know, it's really, I mean, of course you can always come back to the script because as long as you have the raw data and the code, you can do whatever, right? You, you can always have that starting point. Um, but that, that, that's a good point of trying to think of what you need um, and really going through this exercise. And while we're waiting for everyone to catch up, just, you know, the reason I, I point out elevation is a lot of, of the analyses we do in precision ag uh, includes elevation because micro topography or even coarse topography uh, has a lot to do with what happens to yields, water flow, so on. So, you know, if you look at this field, you know, if we didn't have uh, some elevation change, we wouldn't have all that erosion taking place. That's a really great point. Yeah. All right, so let's, um, let's move on here. So now we have this version here that the names are cleaned and we only kept the four columns we needed. The next step, we're gonna use the W2 version. So if you just wanna copy that name and go to the, to the chunk below. So here, what I wanna do is just rename some of these columns to include their units. I particularly like doing that. I think it's, it's something that helps me a lot of times. And even when I get data sets from other people, you know, sometimes you get a column that doesn't have a unit and you have to go ask them. I mean, it may be, it may not be a big deal, but if, if it's already there, then you don't have to, um, I mean, you already know what you need. So if you come you here- You gotta ask me about the files, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was bugging George. Hey George, what is, what is the unit here and there? So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but so if you come here on this next chunk here, you do the assign uh, symbol, we're gonna use this function called rename. Just open and close parentheses. We have to give the entering data set, which is the EO17W2, right? Because now it, it depended on the previous step that we did. So EO17W2, we can just hit enter here. Let me just check my cheat sheet. So make sure I follow what I planned. Okay, so we know that I'm just gonna I'm just gonna like highlight EOW2 in print below so we can see again. Um, you don't have to do if you don't want to, but so now we have speed and dry yield. I would like to 
uh, add the units there. So let's start by um, on the yield one. I want to basically rename this dry yield to yield underscore LBAC for pounds per acre, for short for that. And then we just say equals dry underscore yield. So if you notice here, we're basically saying what's the name of the what's the new name we want to give it, and then we're we're saying where that column that we want to change the name is. What is the name of that column that we want to change the name of? So that's kind of what we do there. And I added a comma and hit enter because we're going to do the same for speed. So we're going to say speed underscore mph equals speed. So if we run that, our yield W3 should have appeared here on, the, on our environment. And if we print it, now we should see those columns with the new names that we just gave them. And remember again here, R, R is um, case sensitive. So if sometimes if you're getting issues with something, it may be because your, your case um, is not matching what's currently on the data set. Okay, is was I mean is any is is anyone having issues up until here that we should stop for a moment? Yes, then. Yeah, here, um, yeah, I'm stuck with this number. Um, so it could be perhaps that sometimes like I forget the commas before hit, hitting enter. Maybe that could be. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah, that's a pretty common um, source of of code breaking is like missing commas or maybe too many commas or parentheses. Yeah. Okay, everybody, everybody's good to this point here on Zoom. I take that as a yes, so I'm going to move on. So again, if you just want to copy this, um, the latest object that we created, we're going to use that as the input of the max function. Okay, so. What if this was, you know, if you needed to have these units of speed and yield on, on the international units, like if you're using this for a paper, you want to publish this, or just you're, out, you're presenting on a conference that is, that is international, you have to have those international units in the state of the frame, which right now we don't have. So let's create those columns, like transform pretty much from English to international units, um, and add those two extra columns in our data frame. So we come here on EO17.4, use the assignment symbol again, and there's a function called mutate. mutate. So mutate is basically the function that we create that we use when we want, we want to create another column, pretty much, which we're gonna do here. So first thing that we do is we give, again, our, our incoming data set, which is EO17.W3, hit comma, Let's hit enter a few times. And the first column that I want to create here is speed underscore KMH for kilometers per hour. So this column is going to depend on the previous one, right? So it's going to depend on the speed MPH. So it's basically gonna be equals to speed underscore MPH. And then you can just copy and paste. I left below here, that um, conversion factor for you. So I can just copy and paste, including the asterisk, which means multiplication. So kilometers per hour is going to pretty much be miles per hour times 1.09 and so on. Now, I also want to create a new column that is going to be yield in kilograms per hectare. So when you come after the eight right there, you can just add a comma, hit enter. And let's type yield underscore kg ha for kilograms per hectare. So yield in kilograms per hectare is going to be equal to our yield pound per acre. 
And then I also left the conversion factor for you right below here. So you can just copy that and remember to include that initial asterisk. So yield kilograms per hectare is gonna be equals to yield pounds per acre times this ratio here. So if you just, if you got your, your commas right, your, your multiplication asterisks right, everything right, it should run and give you no errors. And if you print this object, you should see now two new columns. So on the screen, at least on my screen, I can already see the speed kilometers per hour new column. But if, you, if you're not seeing it, uh, click on that arrow, right arrow there, and then you see the, the, the max yield kilograms per hectare call. So we see now the difference here. So rename did not create new columns, right? It just renamed what we already had and mutate actually kept the columns here, the speed, miles per hour, yield, pounds per acre, and created two new ones based on those. And this is kind of similar of what you would do in Excel, right? It's kind of a similar concept, like if you were adding new columns for, for these conversions here. Okay, so if you, um, you know, I just want to say like, if anyone has any issues at any given time and I'm not stopping to ask, please feel free to interrupt me. The goal here is that we're all following along. Um, so I'm yeah, just going to- conversion to kilometers per hour, correct? I Oh, is it is it wrong? <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's do a quick check here. Uh, per hour. I think I think it's one point six six seven rather than one point zero nine. Oh yeah, that's a good catch. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that would make much difference in what we're doing today, but. Um, no, but that's great. That's great. 1.667, you said? I think that's correct. Essentially, okay. like 60 miles per hour is 100 kilometers per hour, right? So that's that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great catch. Thanks. Thanks, George. So if you all, if if, if everyone wants to change that, uh, 667, just put it there. So yeah, it's just change your conversion factor from um, the one that I had to 1.667. That was a great catch. I think I was fooled by Google um, <laughs> convert, conversion tool. <laughs> you know, if I don't do them with the fractions and the canceling out the units, I get it wrong every time. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. That's a good catch. All right. So let's just go to our next step here. So if we copy this data set, EO17W4, and go below here. So up until now, we have not, so this is still not like, you don't have to type this if you don't want to, but I just want to do like class ELW4. It is a data frame and that's it. It, it is still not being seen by R as a spatial object. So let's change that right now. So on this step here, EO17W5, we're going to, force this object to be seen by R as a spatial. So you can just use that assign symbol. And now this next function comes from the SF package, which has a whole bunch of spatial data analysis functions. And one of them is ST underscore S underscore SF. So that's the one that we wanna have. And so what we do here is the first object that we give it is the, the object coming in. So yield 17 W4. I want to add a comma and hit enter. And it has this argument called chords like that. So we have to tell it because R doesn't know yet that, this is, that it is a spatial object. It doesn't know where that information is stored. So we have to tell it what is the names, what are the names of the columns that have that spatial information. And I'm just gonna print below here the W4 so we can see again. So it's pretty much point X and point Y, right? The way that we say this for this specific argument is using the C function for concatenate. And we have to provide the column names point X and point Y 
uh, in quotation marks. So it will be like that, point X, and then the point Y. Okay, so if we run this and we just print this data set here, now things changed a little, the way that, it, that R is printing this data set to us. So first thing, if you notice, so I'm just gonna reprint the W4, which is the previous step to this, right? It's just a, a tibble, a data frame, right? This is what we see. Now, when we print on the on here after this chunk, the W5, we see that is giving us two, two pages here when printing. If we click on the first one, we see that there is some information here. So it, it is telling us that this is a simple feature. That's why the package is SF. It means simple feature, which is just a simple feature in, in the sense of geospatial features. And then tells us how many rows, how many columns. It says that geometry type is point. So it has guessed that from, from our data set. It has dimensions X, Y, then it gives here values for minimum maximum on the X and Y axis. And then something to notice here, CRS, which is our uh, coordinate reference system, NA. Before we talk more about that, just hold on. I wanna go to the next uh, page that was printed here and show you. So now something, some, there's something different here. So if you see, speed yield, speed yield are still there. We don't have any more the point X and point Y columns, but now we have this geometry column and it's of the type SFC point. What happened is now this object called, oh, and also let me go back here and just print the class of this new object. Remember that the class function is very helpful many times. And here we're gonna use just to see how are we seeing it. So data frame TBL and TBLDF were, were still, were already there on the previous one. Now we see that it's also of type SF, simple feature, which in our lingo, it means it, it is seen as a spatial layer. And what happens is I'm gonna print again on the console the yield 17W5. If we look at this geometry column, what it did here is basically it kept our object as a data frame where one of the columns of this data frame actually contains all the spatial information that we need to make sense of this geospatial layer. So that's pretty much what that geometry column is. We did not call, we, it was not something that we did. We did not say create a geometry column. It was already done when we transformed here, the STSSF is the function to transform a CSV, for example, into a, a geospatial layer. So I wanna just come back here to the first panel that was printed and talk a little bit about the CRS part. So CRS NA, it means that R was not able to guess for us what is the coordinate reference system based on the columns that we gave it. And I wanna, let's see here, let me just, so here, here's a very, yes, Ben. Oh, you were not able to get SF going. Okay, yeah, yeah. This function here relies on having the the package SF. So let me just uh, just check quickly here on spend. Make sure that he's going. <laughs> I want to, I just want to print here the previous one where we could still see the X and Y columns. And I want to ask um, perhaps like people that are doing some research near Tifton. Um, and if you, if you have seen any spatial coordinates taken in that region, in that part of the state, can you, can anyone help me or to help me here to guess what, when these data points were collected, what was the coordinate reference system used? Can you guess just by looking at the, at these numbers? 
or I mean, yes. Did someone say something? Sorry. No, I unmuted. I so uh, the um, are you looking for like WGS eighty four? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is that what you think that this was recorded as? I think so. Yeah. Can you tell me why you, you came to that conclusion? Um, that's always what I use, and the numbers look familiar. So yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm just assuming. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a great guess because it uses decimal degrees. Yep. So, uh, it, it that guess is correct, and it's it's um, it is it was WGS eighty four. So it is like a geographic coordinate system, right? Like using degrees. Um, so it was a good. It was a. I also kind of guessed, and what I did was then assign WGS as the original coordinate reference system. And we're gonna do that next. But I just wanna call your attention here. This is something that I came across a few times on my, on my work is if you don't know what was the original reference system that was used when it was collected, you're just seeing the, those numbers. Cause I mean, there are so many different ones, right? And of course, WGS 84 and UTM are some of the most popular ones used but there are so many others. And I've, I've came across some, la some layers that were using some coordinate reference system that I could not figure out what it was. And the thing is, if that information of what was the original reference system used when the data was collected, if you don't know what that is and you cannot make a good guess, and by a good guess, I mean, you, you tell the layer what you think it is and then you plot it if, like on a map. If it falls where you, where you think it should be, then you're probably guess right. But I'm just saying all this because sometimes I've done this guess and it was just completely off. It was like in the middle of the ocean. And I was like, okay, this was not WGS84. It was not UTM. I don't know what it was. Nobody was there to tell me. There was no metadata to tell me. So I'm just making this point that it's really important for you before you make any transformations, you have to know what was the original one that was collected as. Because that, if you don't have that information, then it's, you're not going to be able to transform this to UTM or something else that would be more um, useful for analysis. Just wanted to make that point there. And as Emily mentioned, I also, my first guess was also WGS84. And uh, so that's what I assigned to this layer. And then I plotted and it made sense in a map, like in a Google map. So I thought it was the correct guess. <laughs> that was my, my uh, judgment. It's safe to say, though, that. Um... It's a good guess because we know that these data were derived um, using a GPS receiver, right? And as we learned from um, the, the, the section we were studying before Dr. Bassas joined us, typically GPS data uh, coordinates are reported in WGS84. Uh, although there are different uh, updates of WGS84, so I'm assuming here we're not worrying about the updates, right? It's just going straight to WGS84. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so remember that as a, as a, you know, if you have to guess, um, as Emily did, um, that's that's what you're going to guess. That's true. That's true. All right. So in our next chunk here, let's actually, let's, so our EO17 W5 is already spatial, but it doesn't, but when we check the, let me just print that again here so we can see. It doesn't have a CRS, it's NA. So we have to first assign the correct CRS, which we're gonna do here on the next chunk, yield 17 w 6 So we use the assign uh, symbol, and then there's a function from the SF package that's called st underscore set underscore CRS. So we're basically gonna set the CRS of this layer so the first argument there again is the incoming data set. So yield 17 w 5 we had a comma, hit tab. And then it has this argument called value. So the, well, if you guys um, are not familiar with EPSG identifiers, we're not gonna get too much into that, but each of the coordinate reference systems that exist have one value identifier that's called the EPSG code that you can use to refer to that. Because otherwise, 
it's you have to provide lots of other information to refer to a given coordinate reference system that that EPSG identifier is just a lot simpler than providing like a lot more of information that we would need otherwise. So the, um, the, the EPSG value for WGS 84 is 4326. This is, if you work more in spatial data, you're gonna see this, you're gonna use a lot this EPSG value. As, uh, as uh, George mentioned, uh, it is really, you know, the, the default in many, um, in many equipment that we use. And so uh, it's a pretty common one to come across. So if you ran that and you were successful and you can print this object W6, so the data set itself is still the same, but if we come here on that first window that it prints to us, look how now it looks a little bit different this last part here. So before it was saying CRS and A, now it's saying geodetic CRS WGS 84. Awesome. So we assigned the, to the layer, the original um, coordinate reference system that was used when the data was collected. Now, what I wanna show you here is the following. So WGS 84, as, as you all probably already know at this point, is in degrees, right? So what happens is every time, at least myself, and I guess many people actually also follow this is, when you're trying to do anything that requires geospatial calculations. So if you're doing interpolation or if you're creating a grid and you're trying to extract values, if you're doing things like that, it's, I think it's better to, to have the default mindset of changing your CRS to, to, met, to, to like distance and not degree. Because degrees, as you probably know, change depending where, like how much a degree actually translates into distance changes depending where you are in the globe, right? It could change because of how the, how the uh, latitude and longitude arches are closer or farther away from the equator. And so because of that, doing comp like geospatial computation using a degree um, reference could give you erroneous results just because of that. Because degrees don't translate the same to distance everywhere in the globe. So with that, I want to change this to a distance-based coordinate reference system. And the most popular one is the Universal Transverse Mercator UTM. So let's do that in the next step here. And before we actually do that, I don't think you have this code here, but I, you're gonna have when I share my mind with you. I just, I'm just, I just had a couple of chunks here uh, with some figures from, from Google, Google Images, just to show you what UTM really does. So UTM basically splits the earth into this slivers that go from north to south, and you refer to them. So let's say Georgia uh, is in between the 16, the zones, 16, 17. So there are multiple zones like going north, south, and then that zone is split between north and south for the different hemispheres. So this is how the world looks like in the UTM zoning. And when we come to the US, and we look at Georgia, we see that Georgia, depending where you are in Georgia, you can actually be in zone 17 or 16. And this is important because when we are defining the UTM, so WGS84, I mean, there are some different versions, but they, they apply the same to the, to the, to the world. When it comes to UTM, you have to specify which zone you are to get it right. And so in our case here was actually very interesting because our field was right next to the border between 16 and 17, but it's actually in the 16 zone on the UTM um, CRS. And because we are in the Northern hemisphere, we are in zone 16 North. So that's where the UTM 16 North is what we have to tell when we change from WGS 84 to UTM next. So this becomes more or less like a Cartesian coordinate system, although it's not exactly, you can see, you still see the, the, the vertical lines are uh, getting closer together as you go further north. Um, we, we actually had a field, Leo, uh, several years ago that was uh, in, in both. It was quite the nightmare. Oh no. It was right on the dividing line because a lot of the field work we do is in that Southwest part of the state. And it was a 300 acre field that was exactly on the dividing line. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 
quite the nightmare there. Yeah, I can't. We had to divide it up into two two fields to be able to solve uh, to solve the problem. Um, yeah. We weren't smart enough to figure it out otherwise. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good fix. I think I would probably do something like that as well. So uh, the next last thing we're going to do here. So just use the W six. And you don't have all these these chunks with figures because I, I included them afterwards. But if you come here on the chunk yield 17 W7 is when we're going to transform from WGS84 to UTM 16 North. So we use the assign symbol there. There is a function called ST underscore transform, where again, the first thing we give it is the incoming data set, which is yield 17 W6 and a comma, we hit enter and then it has an argument called CRS. So we're gonna say CRS equal, and we're gonna use the EPSG code for UTM N8083 16 North, which is, the code is 6345. So now if we just hit the play button here, it's gonna apply that and save on EO 17W7. And it is already printing for us below here, that object. If you check the panel now, the only, I mean, a couple of things actually changed here. So one of them is the X mean or the mean and max for X and Y, they change in values. So before I think X mean we had a negative, I mean, both for X mean and max, we had a negative value because we were, because the US is um, to the left of the main meridian. And that means that we're on the negative side of that quadrant. However, now it has it is when we change to UTM is actually using a different reference meridian that is specific to that zone, 16 north. Uh, so now we have that value as a positive value. So everything now is positive. And also the main thing to note is that now it says projected projected CRS NAD 83 2011. UTM zone 16. So all this information here is important for us. And I just want to go up so you can see again what was the previous one. It was saying geodetic CRS WGS84. So that geodetic um, it kind of gives us that impression that WGS is a geographic reference system, meaning that it uses degrees and it's not projected yet on a on a on a surface. And when we change that to UTM, it is projected now. And, and also the units here changed. So before WGS was in degrees, UTM is in meters. So that's important for us to measure those more, um, more precise distances that are important when you're doing any type of geospatial analysis that you use distances in. You may remember um, a few days ago when we were, I was giving you an example of, of uh, radiometric resolution and we calculated NDVI from some, uh, some satellite data. And I told you, don't worry about the coordinate system now because it looks weird. It, those coordinates were transformed into UTM just like here. So if you go back and check those numbers in those slides, they'll match more or less these numbers here. Uh, they were the, That field was approximately in the same place. Perfect. And also before, I, mean, I know we're a little bit over time, but I just, I think it's worthwhile to point out. So everything we did here, so we did seven steps pretty much, right? Where we went from raw data. So we cleaned the names, uh, selected the columns we wanted, re renamed some columns, transformed some columns from English to international units, transformed this object to, um, to a spatial object. We defined then the, the original uh, CRS and then transform that CRS to UTM. So all these seven steps here is what I would I would call the data wrangling steps for this data set. And if you notice, at each one of those points, we had to save the whatever we were doing. We had to save in an object and use that object as the input of the next function seven times. Right? That's what we did throughout. And I did all that just to show you here that there is actually a concept in programming languages, I guess, not just R. That is the pipe. And in R, the pipe means is this symbol here is the percent greater than percent, where what the pipe does is it takes whatever it is on its left and uses that as the input of whatever it is on its right. 
So for example, if I only do this part here, it would be the same result as our clean names function. If I continue and I just do the pipe workflow up until here, it is gonna do clean names and select. I'm just printing that just so you see that it's doing that. So the, the goal here is that when you use the pipe, you do not have to specify the input it, of the next function, because it, it, it is already implied that it, the input is what's coming from the left side of the pipe. So if we just run all this here, it's gonna be pretty much the same result as our last object here. And this is important, it's just more, more of a programming concept than anything else, but we're gonna be using the pipe for in, in future uh, steps. And it's just really a lot easier because it saves you from keeping all these intermediate products that you really don't care. You just need that product to the next step and also just connects things very nicely. So I just wanted to leave this here so you can see and kind of understand this concept of the pipe. Okay, so right now, this is where we stopped. We have our geospatial data set with the columns we needed, transformed, clean names, everything perfectly. And then next Wednesday, we're actually gonna go through and my goal is to finish all the yield editing parts which is the main meat of this of this uh, lab here. It's kind of interesting because I'm, you know, I'm not only showing you here how to do your editor. We're actually going through some statistical concepts, some programming concepts, some geospatial concepts, all mixed together. So that's why it's taking a little bit longer to get to the actual goal of this. But I hope that you can actually use these skills for other projects as well. Okay, so this is everything that I had. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Don't forget assignments are due. If you haven't turned it in, assignments are due at the end of the day today. Thanks for the reminder, George. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and, and also I think it was, it, 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 turned, it turned out to be a very, very good timing because if you, you're, you're gonna have read the paper by when we actually get to the editor steps, and I think that's going to help you to understand what we're going to see now. Those concepts, some of the concepts of the paper apply to this data set here directly. So I think it's going to be helpful to, to have read the paper before you know, our next lab. All right. I think that's all I had. Uh, I'm going to be posting the videos uh, to YouTube and linking them on the website as well in case you want to go back and check. And if you have any issues or questions, always feel free to reach me out either by email or by or making a visit to my office here in Athens. Great, right. I enjoyed this today, actually getting to do the all the transformations. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really handy. Yeah, really, really useful and very simple, right? Very simple code, nothing to- but Yeah, if you can remember, yeah. You know, my yeah. Brain Swiss cheese, I can't remember in five minutes, I wouldn't know how to do this without going back and checking. <laughs> We have it all there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, Google is 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 your friend when you're doing programming. I Google all the time. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, everyone, have a good uh, rest of the day, and see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank